Sex, Money, and Enlightenment. We'll be doing it all tonight on Talk Gnosis. Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis for April 13th, 2013. I'm Father Tony Sylvia and joining me direct from his whirlwind tour of Scandinavia and the subcontinent, Bishop Thomas Langley. Bishop, hello. Hey, Padre, how you doing? Good, good. How was your tour? It was uh, whirlwind indeed. <laughs> All right, terrific. So uh, we have a guest tonight who's going to be talking to us about his work. Uh, our guest is Jason Miller, and he is a, a teacher, an author, and a sorcerer. His blog is strategicsorcery.com, and uh, you can find out more about him there. Welcome, Jason. Thank you very much for coming. Hello, hello. It's uh, the website strategicsorcery.net. Yes, okay, you're right. So I can see it right down the bottom when you talk there. So <laughs> strategicsorcery.net. Anyway, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do to people. What I do to people? <laughs> we get right to the point, don't we? Um, no, I am, you know, I've been involved in practical magic and esoteric studies since I was 15 years old. And um, I spent uh, a good amount of my life pretty much dedicated to it. I've traveled through Europe to study ceremonial magic and uh, witchcraft. I've uh, traveled in the United States and, and gone down to New Orleans and places like that to study hoodoo and, and uh uh, folk magic here, and studied uh, Tantra and Buddhism in Nepal, where I lived for a while. And um, eventually all this kind of came together in my head and, you know, formed a, a solid underpinning of a system. So I started teaching and writing, and uh, over the last few years I've written uh, three books and developed a year-long course, and... Uh, you know, on top of that, I do magic for people that need help. All right, yeah, and um, you were recently a, uh, you did a lecture for us at Talk Gnosis in New York City. You talked about your book, Financial Sorcery. Uh, it was very popular, and, and people seem to, uh, people seem to, to kind of get what you were talking about. Well, you know, it's an important topic, um, and it's one that, is given short shrift in a lot of spiritual circles. Yes. So it's uh, you know it it's important when getting stuff like this show together or a group together that wants permanent space or um, you know it, it, there's no avoiding money really. Um, you know I've, I've always said that if you're going to be a, a non-materialist person, then you either need to you know, bite the bullet and become a homeless wandering yogi or uh, join a monastery, be it Buddhist, Catholic, whatever, um, so that, you know, you're really renouncing materialism. And if you're not going to do one of those things, and I have yet to have somebody hit me up for the phone number to, uh, you know, a monastery, um, then uh, you've got to master it because, uh, you know, you can't serve spirit and mammon, uh, which means that if you're not going to serve it and you're not going to be able to avoid it, then you have to master it. So thus financial sorcery was born. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and this came out of your work with the various traditions that you were um, that you mentioned up front, right? There's there's some um, some hoodoo practice in there, and some some ritual magic practice in there, mm -hmm. and some you know just plain old financial advice, which I think that a lot of people, especially uh, quite frankly, a lot of magicians uh, could use. <laughs> well, you know the, the I'd say probably sixty percent of the book, and I'll hold it up. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> is a, just a, a, a regular old book on personal finance. Yep. And the rest of it is magic that hangs on each of those points. And literally every week I get an email from somebody who is saying, you know, well, I, I've done lots and lots of spells. Because let's face it, anyone involved in magic 
they know a lot of spells. You know a lot of rituals already. Mm -hmm. uh, so access to more and more rituals and, and names and spirits is not really the problem that we face. But they'll say, you know, it never occurred to me that the reason I wasn't getting a job is because my resume was terrible. I never linked the idea that I needed to have a good resume and a good spell. It was always just like, well, I do all this work for the for the ritual. Nothing else should matter. It should all just, you know, overcome all that. And that's, of course, not the way that magic works. Uh, you know, I mean, if you are, you know, a homely guy who lets your appearance go and you uh, do nothing to be charming, then, you know, supermodels are not going to hang on your arm. Um, and it, similarly, if you, uh, you know, have no skills and don't know how to present yourself professionally on paper or in person, then it doesn't matter how good your magic is. It's just not going to do the trick for you alone. Well, Jason, if we could, um, if we could shift away from the um, specific financial stuff, because... Um, We've got three videos of you on uh, the YouTube channel for folks who want to, and, and they should buy your book. Um, but I had a, um, in reading your books, um, not just the financial sorcery book, but the others as well, um, I noticed, and as you mentioned in your introduction, you, uh, you bring together in your personal experience um, witchcraft, ceremonial magic, hoodoo, uh, voodoo, um, tantra, and, and other things as well. Um, how do you... How do you make a cohesive system out of that in your own head? And can you talk a little bit about <laughs> about eclecticism? We've touched on that in personal conversations, eclecticism, and how does that how does that work for you? Pulling pull this stuff together. Well, I'm I'm glad you asked that. I'm actually going to uh, give a talk on sane eclecticism at Bryn Mawr College to uh, the, the Mellon Grant group. Did you say sane or saint? Sane, as uh -oh. in not okay. insane, but All right, sane. I you know, a new, a new lower you were working with. <laughs> no, no. Uh, you know, it's it's how does one uh, pull things together from various traditions without absolutely running amok and being disrespectful and things like that, uh, which I also see a lot of. So for me, there are a couple rules. Um, you know, first of all, is realizing where you are within a certain tradition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for instance, you can reach uh, competency in certain things fairly quickly. And that competency is not mastery. So, but competency is important. You can use a core competency in a skill and apply it to something else that you you're maybe working on mastering. Mm -hmm. So I would say the the bulk of my magical training, the most intense period, was with Tibetan Buddhism. And within Tibetan Buddhism, it has everything. It has folk magic in it. It has high ceremonial magic. It has meditation. It has um, you know high philosophy and and. It's all there, so there's never been this sort of um, idea that you're a folk me magician or a ceremonialist or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm also a Westerner, and I've also been exposed to all of these traditions, and I think that one of the unique benefits of living in the time that we live is that the, the traditions of the world are open books. They're, they're right there for us uh, to take a look at. And we naturally run into people from all these different traditions. Um, you know, I grew up in central New Jersey, and before I was 21, I had uh, a hoodoo teacher from Lakewood, New Jersey. I had a Rosicrucian teacher uh, that was actually uh, someone from the town that I grew up in. I had a Buddhist teacher uh, from a couple towns over um, and had joined a, a Wiccan coven a couple towns over. So all of this was pre-internet. 
You know, I mean, I didn't. I it wasn't like it is today, where you just type in and next thing you know, you've joined the OTO. Um, but you know, this was all person to person connections. So to not be eclectic in some ways, you you kind of have to ignore everyone else mm. and pretend that you know their magic and their systems don't influence you but of course one of the big points i made in protection and reversal magic is that okay you know you might be a practitioner of let's say i don't know golden dawn style ceremonial magic and somebody else you know say this is actually a case where somebody had an employer uh, an employee, and that person was practicing uh, a type of uh, <coughs> excuse me, a little cold there. Uh, Afro uh, traditional religion, and there was an employer-employee conflict, and you know, magic was introduced into the fray, and uh, you know, he didn't quite know how to respond because it was so different than what he had been trained in and against. Um, but yet the modern world throws these people together. So uh, I would say the rules are, you know, you need to know where you are. You can't pretend, you know, if you read a few books on voodoo and you even do some rituals on voodoo and, and honestly spend years, you know, working out of books and even talking with people and maybe going to a feat here and there, that doesn't make you a hungan. Um, there are people who dedicate their lives to it. You know, do you at that point practice voodoo? Well, yes, I suppose that you do. But you shouldn't pretend to be the, the world's master of it. Um, next rule is to be respectful, to not... Uh, usurp uh, things that are traditional and present, you know, if you're doing something very non-traditional, don't present it as the tradition. For instance, I practice Tibetan Buddhism pretty much by the book. Um, and so my main uh, tantric practice is Dorji Purba, the, the uh, Vajrakalaya, the Purba, the three-sided dagger. You might remember from the Golden Child, I, 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 I want the knife, please. <laughs> um, so I've met people that have these purbas and they say, oh, well, it's my athame and I use it to cast circle and, and all these things. It's like, well, you know, okay, that's all well and good, but you know that's not purba practice. And they don't know that. They're just like, well, I'm a, pur I'm a purba practitioner too. I, you know use it to, I stab the air and I'm like, no, that's not how it's used. <laughs> but that's how the spirits told me to use it. It's like, well, you know, maybe your spirits, but that's not the way it's used. So there it drifts into disrespect. Mm -hmm. But we can't pretend that tech isn't tech. And so a big rule I have is to try, it can't always be done, but to try to separate what is tech from what is symbol set. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Most uh, eclectic mashups these days do exactly the opposite of what I'm suggesting. Right. They mesh symbol sets, but they don't really mesh tech. So in other words, somebody decides they're, you know, they're trained in Wicca or they're trained in OTO type magic. And they decide, okay, I am going to, I'm really into this Tibetan Buddhism stuff. I'm really into Santeria this week because I read a book and now I'm all, you know, filled with exotic ideas. So rather than do magic the way that they do magic, I'm going to plug these, you know, beings into the Kabbalah, cast a circle with them and the quarters, and basically do the same ritual that I always do. I'm just going to dress up and and sort of uh, go on Tibetan holiday instead of doing a star ruby I'll be doing you know the star Vajra ritual and it'll have you know so it's really the same type of magic when what would be better 
is if they stuck with the same symbol set that they've been using, but looked for the tech. So, for instance, if you were looking at uh, Santeri and if you were looking at uh, Tibetan Buddhism, there's a lot of offering tech mm -hmm. um, that isn't there in uh, OTO uh, Thelemic type magic. So adding offerings to local beings, adding offerings, you know, in Tibetan Buddhism, there's lots of uh, casting of sem cores or mind circles, mm -hmm. uh, usually envisioned as like Vajra fences that really populate the whole of reality. But before you do this, you make an offering to say, hey, I'm going to be, uh, you know, mucking up space here, so please take these offerings and, you know, clear out or else you might get, you know, your toes stomped on. Um, so that's something that could easily be added in a Thelemic context. Um, making offerings in, you know, in, uh, say, Santeria style um, can use a lot of stuff. You know, as, as we all know, Thomas, I've been to your apartment, you know, there's a lot of stuff that gets offered. And, uh, you know, mine too. But one of the things that the Tibetans do is if you don't have a lot of room for stuff or, or, or even if you do have stuff, you multiply it uh, through energy and visualization so that whatever you have is considered a material base. Mm -hmm. And then you can multiply it. And then there are also things where people are uncomfortable with, say, blood offerings or something like that. And uh, while well, there's a lot of voodoo people who are using red palm oil, Tibetans have had this problem for 1,400 years, and they use uh, red uh, tormas. So these are basically cakes that are baked to look like, you know, severed human heads with the eye stalks out and everything like that. And so you bring it out. To the indigenous deities of pre-Buddhist days, right? Exactly. You know, Padma Sambhava goes through Tibet and he he says, hey, you know, you've got to stop messing with us. We're, we're uh, setting up this monastery. And, they, and converts all he, them to guardian, uh, guardians of the Dharma. <coughs> yeah, basically. But, the, but they say, well, okay, we'll protect the Dharma, but, you know, we still got to eat. <laughs> so he says, well, okay, well, you know, here you go. Here's uh, this lovely meal. Of of uh, you know gnarly uh, fleshy stuff, and of course anyone that's ever been to you know a, a, an offering or a sacrifice realizes that the spirits do not actually physically dissolve and eat the stuff. Otherwise, cleanup would be a breeze. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, we're we're coming up against our time here, so I want to get through a couple of other things. You you teach a couple of courses. Can you tell people what kind of courses you teach and what they can expect? Sure. Um, my main course uh, that's open to anyone is called the Strategic Sorcery uh, Online Course. It's a year-long course in practical magic, and. Uh, 52 weeks, 52 lessons. It's uh, $150, so it's about you know three bucks a lesson, and it covers everything from uh, meditation, which constantly vexes people, but it, it teaches astral projection, astral mechanics. Um, it teaches materia, how to work with it. It teaches how to work with spirits. Uh, in a multitude of contexts, it teaches money magic, it teaches wrathful magic, and uh, at the end lessons we get into some like hyperdimensional weirdness just uh, just to cap just to leave it off with like you know and here's some more steps into further advanced stuff that you won't ever read about anywhere else. Um, and then I also have a course that uh, has limited people in it called the Strategic Self, uh, which is a 26-week course, and that's uh, that's the window for that only opens a few times. I've I've been very slow at writing it. The whole thing is not done yet. So, uh, but it basically focuses on non-ritual magic and. Uh, work on 
basically the self as the tool of, of magic. So self-transformation, self-possession, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, good. Um, now, where, can, so, where can people find uh, information about these courses? How do they sign up? Well, uh, you can go to strategicsorcery.net or you can Google the Strategic Sorcery blog. And uh, I always have postings there about it. Or you can email me at innominandum at gmail.com. And uh, I think you can see in my graphic below the skyline there, uh, maybe a nominandum is there somewhere. Oh, we'll, we'll put uh, it in the show notes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can email me uh, with strategic sorcery in the title, and uh, we'll, we'll slip you right in uh, and, to the program. Can people start these courses at any time, or are there the first course, or is there like a semester type setup? They can really start at any time. For my own sanity, I have a cycle system uh, where basically every quarter I start a new cycle, a new group of people uh, that start getting the lessons at lesson one. And but if they if people sign up after the beginning of a cycle, I just send them back lessons. So usually you can join it pretty much any time and depending upon whether you join uh, you know if you join at Halloween for the beginning of a new cycle then you'll be starting at lesson one uh, I'm probably I'm gonna announce cycle 13 of the course which is just uh, amazing there's been wow. over 600 people that have taken the course and uh, it's just been you know probably one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done, getting the homeworks from people uh, at the beginning of the course saying, you know, well, I, I want to open up uh, an Irish pub, and then not even at the end, like midway through the course, hey, I, you know, my pub is a huge success. Or, uh, you know, people that start off, look, I, you know, I've had a rough time in love, and then, you know, towards the end of the course, they're like, you know, I'm getting married. Um, you know, some people have reported back with, you know, job offers in six figures. Other people that just had tried every program under the sun for astral projection and, you know, are now able to do that on a regular basis, whereas they weren't able to before. So uh, getting that kind of feedback from it has been one of the best things I've ever done in my life. Huh, that's great. Uh, well, that's uh, a glowing recommendation. I think I've heard from other people uh, about your course as well, and um, you know, check it out if you're interested. Uh, Thomas, I don't want to spring this on you. I forgot to put this in the notes, but do you want to talk about our survey a little bit? Oh yes, um, we've been getting a lot of feedback here at Gnostic NYC uh, as well from uh, folks who. Um, are interested in some of the topics that we've been discussing um, in our 20-minute videos or our longer lecture series, and uh, they want to go deeper into the Gospel of Thomas, into the Gnostic history, the Gnostic Gospels, that sort of thing. So um, we have uh, decided to uh, to take our, our programming to the next level. Uh, sometime soon we're going to roll out a, uh, a, a set of uh, online courses. Um, I, I'm thinking, uh, I think we agree that they're going to be generally 10-week-long 10 week lo 10 week long courses. And we have a survey, which we will have uh, the link to in the show notes, I guess, Father? Yeah, um, and you can find it all over our social media right. sites. We right, wanna know, um, we want to know what you're interested in, what you'd like to talk about in the course. Um, uh, we have a list of our own suggestions and places for you to uh, put, put your own ideas. And um, I think sometime maybe around July we'll even be ready to start rolling these out. And uh, these will be available on a sort of a semester basis, and uh, we'll be using online software so you can go back and take older courses as they accumulate. And I'm uh, really excited about the, this next step. I think it'll be a, a, a learning adventure for all of us. Yeah, I, I think so too, and I think it's something that people have been asking for, so I'm happy to... Uh that we're going to start being able to provide it. Uh, so please it, uh, do go take that survey if you would. It'll only take you a minute or two, um, and it will really kind of help us to 
plan uh, plan what we're going to do and, and see what's feasible and what isn't. So uh, we'll put that link in the description. I uh, took the survey. Th thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, great. Um, it, what, what did you want to take? What, what are you interested in? Oh, well, you know, the offering on Gnostic magic uh, obviously was was there, but, um, you know, I mean, the... The the offerings on the Gospels, the you know, a lot of people don't really understand the difference between Valentinian Gnosticism, Sethian Gnosticism. Um, I'd love to see, you know, it, it wasn't listed on there, but, you know, if anybody knows uh, anything about Mandean Gnosticism, uh, New Jersey has the largest uh, congregation of Mandeans outside the Middle East. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that would be of interest to me. So, uh, but, you know. Some Mandeans on the Gnostic NYC meetup as well. Oh, yeah. cool. But I don't think they've actually come to anything. But, yeah, no, I would, I would love to. Uh, it's not a, su a subject I know very much about, but we'd, we will certainly try and look for an expert in that. But, yeah, I saw, I saw it and... Uh, you know, as I, as I was looking it over, I said, you know, the 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 presence is there in this work so that you guys are doing. That I can, you know, that Aleleth the luminary is just like watching over and illuminating this whole thing. So I'm very excited to see you guys do this. Oh, well, thank you very much. I, I hope it's successful. <laughs> so uh, Jason Miller, StrategicSorcery.net. Thank you very much once again for being on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, and we'll talk to you again soon, I'm sure. Um, if you have any comments or questions uh, about this show, please leave them in the comments section, or you can email us at talknosis at gnosticnyc.com. All the show notes and the social media links will be in the description. Coming up on Talk Gnosis April 20th, we're going to be talking to Joe Moore, the host of the Occult Sentinel podcast. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about um, a healing uh, method that he does called holotropic breathwork. Um, Joe has tried to explain this to me on a number of occasions, and I have yet to actually understand what he's talking about. So uh, I hope we're going to get some uh, get to the bottom of it uh, on the 20th. And then coming up at Gnostic NYC for our regular lecture series, we're going to be talking about the legendary Count Cagliostro, Sunday, April 21st, 2 p.m. at CRS, which is 123 Fourth Avenue in Manhattan on the second floor. Uh, come and see us if you're in the area on April 21st. You can see information about this and all upcoming programs at GnosticNYC.com. Uh, if you are interested in helping to support the programs that we're putting on here and our expanding uh, programming lineup, we would really appreciate if you could make a donation. Go to our website, GnosticNYC.com, and click the button on the left-hand side at the bottom of the menu, and we will hug a kitten for everybody who donates. And this has been a production of Gnostic NYC. If you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends. Click the like button and subscribe to our channel. Opinions expressed on this program really do not necessarily represent the views of Gnostic NYC or of any other organizations. No animals were sacrificed during the production of this show. For more talk gnosis, tune in live every Saturday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.